Hello guys, so this is lecture 4.4 and today I want to talk in general about abelian groups. So basically about classification. And I'm not going to do uh, the classification theorem of abelian groups in all details, but I will explain a considerable part of that and uh, we will come back to it next quarter. So. Okay, so firstly, uh, so let's suppose that A is an abelian group, A is abelian, and uh, we know a bunch of examples already. So we know that Z is abelian, uh, we know that Z over PZ is abelian, where P is prime, so these guys are called, uh, yeah, okay, and, and actually there is a Z over NZ for any N, and these guys are called cyclic groups, uh, and, um, of course, there are their products, z over pz times z over qz or something like that. And uh, the main idea is that if you just look at finitely generated abelian group, uh, it will be always a product of those. So, uh, let me remind you this definition. So, maybe I will formulate it in a slightly different way. So, a group G is finitely generated um, if maybe there exists some elements G1 to the, the Gn where n is some finite number such that G is just uh, you know, generated by them. So every element in G is a product of these guys and their inverses. And uh, of course, for abelian group, it's more convenient to write it down additively, so I'll write sum instead of product. And um, then we can look at abelian groups which are finitely generated. And the main result here is a theorem which says that uh, A is abelian finitely generated group, then A is a product of cyclic groups. So, so things like Z times Z times Z over 5Z times z over 25z and times z over 12z. That's an example of a huge abelian group. So now you probably understand why a uh, product of groups is such an important construction. It's the simplest way to build groups from old groups. And that's an example of a large product which, which is abelian and uh, actually every finitely generated abelian group is not like is like that. So what is example of a not finitely generated abelian group? So we can take an example being Q as additive group. So this one is not not finitely generated. Finitely generated. And I don't want to formally write the proof, but like imagine it's finitely generated by some numbers uh, and they're rational, so I can write them in this way. And, uh, yeah, let's suppose, let me prove it. Let's suppose uh, this number is generated and, and there are some numbers up to mk and k. So, let's suppose that. But uh, for any element, if you take any element, which is a linear combination of those, which, which, uh, so if it is generated, it means every element is there. Uh, ah, sorry, let me, let me say slightly differently. So, uh, so let's say it's this way. So let's take, so take uh, prime number P such that uh, 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 P does not divide and one and so on up to n k. So consider a prime number which doesn't divide any denominator. And uh, I have not maybe proved that, but number of uh, prime numbers is infinite. And you probably know that the trick is to consider 
kind of product of all primes up to some prime at one. And then this is a number which is not divisible by any of PIs. So it has to be divisible by some other prime. And in this way, you prove their number is infinite. And so take prime, which is not, uh, which does not divide any of the denominators. And then we know that one over P is a rational number, right? So if rational number is generated by these guys, then we can write one over P as a sum x1 m1 over n1 plus d -d -d plus xk mk over nk. And uh, uh, this x1 up to xk, they are integers, right? So finitely generated means every element is a product of elements in the generating set. It's a billion, you can rewrite them, and we write addition instead of multiplication. So uh, that holds. But then you can, uh, what it means, you can uh, say that this implies that n1 times and so on times nk equals prime times something complicated. And I, I can write, it's like x1, n2, nk, m1, plus t -t 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 -t. But anyways, it will be some, something which happens when you just multiply a common denominator, and that's integer. And so the product, uh, so number p divides n1 times nk, and that's a contradiction. So basically, Q is not finitely generated exactly because there are infinitely many primes. That's more or less uh, uh, at least closely related statement. Um, okay, so that's an example uh, that's not finitely generated. Here is another one. So you can take uh, Q and you know Q has a subgroup being Z. And then you take, can take a quotient group. Q factored over Z. And that's pretty wild group. So these are rational numbers, but you identify them when they are different by an integer. And, and it's also not finitely generated. Not finitely generated. So you cannot present it as a product Z times Z times Z times some number of Z over N Zs. Okay, so these are some counterexamples. Everything else is of this type. That's a classification theorem of abelian groups. So, before I will prove that, uh, let me make a remark. So, of course, one can ask, okay, are these actually groups distinct? And first, let's look at, uh, uh, you know, z over nz. And the idea is that actually z over 12z, for instance, is itself a product z over 3z times z over 4z. So, that's a very important statement, and we have already discussed it a little bit. Let me maybe say again how that works. Okay, so theorem. Okay, so theorem. And that's again another version of something called Chinese remainder theorem. Remainder theorem. So that's a very important and very elementary statement in number theory, which appears basically everywhere. So let me give one of the formulations. So suppose n and m are coprime integers, then z over n times mz is isomorphic to z over nz times z over mz. So uh, that's a very close story to a problem in your uh, midterm where there was a map from g to g factored over m times g factored over n and then, uh, so here, of course, gz, and these are two subgroups. And then the statement was that if uh, m times n is g, then g over m intersect n is isomorphic to g over m times g over n. And, and indeed, this holds here, because if you take g equal to z, uh, and M being the subgroup generated by M. And N, guess what, is a subgroup generated by N. And then, remember, we have coprime numbers. So what it means, it means that, so N and M are coprime. So it means that the subgroup generated by them, which is NZ plus MZ, is uh, the whole group, right? So remember, that's the one of the definitions of the greatest common divisor. And of course, if you use multiplicative notations, it just says uh, g equals m times n. Um, but on the other hand, you know that, uh, that if you take the intersection, 
So M intersect and then uh, basically what is this? So you take uh, numbers divisible by n intersect them with numbers divisible by m. So these are uh, x an integer such that x uh, is divisible by n and x is divisible by m. But you know they are co-prime, so that happens. This is the same as integers divisible by n m. And so m intersect n is just n m times x times z. So so you get the statement. So so z over n m z is isomorphic to z over n z times z over m z. Uh, so so basically now if you want to understand what this group z over n z looks like, of course you just write n as a product p1 alpha 1 times pk alpha k and then this appears to be isomorphic to z over p1 alpha 1 z times t -t 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 times z over pk alpha k z. And so you can basically assume that every group, uh, so from the theorem above, you know that every group is a product of cyclic groups of type z over p power nz. So, so this uh, uh, theorem, uh, 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 which we formulated before, is equivalent to the statement that every abelian group, sorry, finitely generated abelian group uh, is isomorphic. to uh, a product of z and z over p power n z. But you should be very careful because the same prime can appear many times. For instance, if you just take, you know, uh, uh, prime p uh, equal to 2, you can have something like that. And that's absolutely not the same thing as z over 8z, for instance, though they have the same number of elements. And for this, just this has element of order 8, and this doesn't. And, and one can prove that actually these powers appearing there and the number of these are uniquely defined by the group. And let me not do that. Maybe I will come to that uh, in the next quarter. That's not hard. Uh, I will show just existence. And also I will do it a little bit by hand waving, but uh, the proof is actually completely rigorous. Um, okay, so let's go to this theorem. Okay, so now let me try to explain um, the proof of this theorem. So, uh, Okay, so let's suppose that I have A, and this is a abelian group, group generated by some elements G1 up to GK. So firstly, there is a convenient way to think about it more abstractly. So take a group z power k. That's, you know, k times z. These are basically integer vectors, like vectors in k-dimensional space with integer coordinates. And then you can construct a map from zk to a, which takes a collection of, you know, elements n1 up to nk, and sends them to n1 g1 plus, plus nk gk, and uh, the fact that the group is generated by this element tells me that this map is surjective. So uh, that's what means being finitely generated. There is a surjective map from zk to a. That's a pretty interesting statement. Obvious, but still. So uh, let's look at this map, and I will denote it p. So let's look at kernel p. So what is a kernel of p? So these are relations. And what it means, it means that these are basically some equations which are satisfied by n1, uh, g1, and so on, and k, j, k. So these are elements, sequences n1 up to n, k, such that n1, g1, plus t, d, d, plus n, k, g, k, equals to zero. So these are generators, sorry, relations, kind of equations for gi's. So, for instance, you can take z, and suppose your group is z over 3z, 
zero. And then if you look at a kernel, then you will get basically uh, elements like three or like six and so on. They are all in the kernel. Okay, so uh, let's list all of them. Let's list them. And you can ask like how that's possible, you know, the relations are infinitely many of those, but that doesn't matter, still countable. And so I can just write them down. So it will be like a huge system of equations. N11 G1 plus N1 K G K equals to zero. N21 G1 plus plus N2 K G K equals to zero and so on. And uh, basically, the main idea is that I can perform what's called elementary operations. So that means like exchanging these equations, exchanging the variables, uh, subtracting one variable from another, or subtracting one equation from another. These are all called elementary operations. So elementary operations, elementary operations. And these are, uh, again, let me just say, so there are kind of two types here. You can uh, uh, permute uh, rows or columns, or you can add slash subtract one column from another. And, and the main idea is that these are innocent operations. So if you do them with rows, um, they will literally not change anything. Just the order of equations change, that doesn't matter. If you do it with columns, uh, sorry, for permutations. If you do it with columns, this is just relabeling your GIs. If you permute first and second uh, uh, column, it's just the same as saying, let's substitute G1 with G2 and G2 with G1. Uh, on the other hand, if you subtract or add equations, you see an equivalent system of equations. And clearly, if you know the k and you know equations, you know a, because factor group, right? It's, it's a quotient of z power k over this kernel. And when you just change, uh, subtract one equation from another, then you will get equivalent system of equations. So that doesn't change much. It's, it's basically changing, um, just renaming elements in the kernel. And when you change columns, this is changing uh, uh, a generator set. So let me look at some example. Let's suppose I have equations like 3g1 plus g2 equal to 0 and uh, 2g1 minus 2g2 equal to 0. So that's a pretty uh, natural system of equations. And then I can uh, apply uh, uh, this uh, transformations to simplify it. So this becomes equivalent to, if I subtract 2g1, I will get g1 plus uh, 3g2 equals to 0, and 2g1 minus 2g2 equals to 0. Um, and then I can subtract again the first equation from the second, and I will get uh, g1 plus 3g2 equal to 0, and uh, I subtract twice, minus 6, minus 8, g2 is equal to 0. Okay, and finally, so I want to subtract the first column from the third, and this is basically relabeling. I take g1 prime being g1 plus 3g2, so I kind of add uh, Yeah, okay. And, and g2 prime equal to g2. So if you do that, for these new generators, my first equation will be uh, g1 prime equals to 0. And my second equation is g2 uh, prime times 8 equals to 0. And uh, you see that, uh, okay, now I can say that my group is generated by two generators. One of them is just 0, gives me nothing. Another is a generator is just one relation, 8 times it equals to 0. So what it means, that means that my a will be z over a z. z. And, and that's a pretty general story. So now I want to explain what to do with this infinite system of equations, how to proceed.
Okay, so the idea is very simple. So do row column operations to make um, n11 first enter uh, um, greater or equals than zero and uh, sorry greater or equals than then one and as small as possible. So you can do that until if you have zero system equations, there is nothing you can do. But other than that, you can you know look at everything you can get. Of course, you can just find any non-negative element, move it up and left, and you will get something positive. And then by this induction minimal principle, you just choose among all options. You look at the system equations where this number is as small as possible. So that's not a constructive procedure. It's not something you can actually do by hand very easily. But uh, um, there is an algorithm. I don't care. I just want to do it abstractly. And so now look what happens. So I have here some number N11 uh, G1 plus d. So, what can I say about it? So, uh, um, uh, the main idea is that actually, uh, uh, actually, all these elements and all these elements, these elements are divisible, divisible by n11. And the reason is that imagine it's not, so suppose something is not divisible and then you can divide it with the remainder. Suppose somewhere here you see q n11 plus r and then you can take the first column, subtract from this one q times, you will get r, move it to the first place, you get something smaller. So it's the same proof we did when we uh, proved that every subgroup of z is something times z and so on. And so you get that, that if you believe that your choice is the smallest, then everything else is divisible by n11. And then by row and column operations, you can subtract the first column from any other uh, column and the first row from any other row. And you will get that you have n11g1 plus uh, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, And everything below is still 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So, that's interesting. Uh, and and again, notice, since I always can, can do that, I don't need to know anything is finite, it's okay uh, it to assume that my system of equations is infinite. That doesn't matter. And then I just reapply the same technique. So now I can say, okay, so uh, there is this uh, uh, smallest element. Uh, I do columns and row operations on everything except the first and uh, column and row. So that this element n to 2 g2 becomes the smallest. And uh, then I subtract it from everything else and I get zeros. And so eventually I do that until I stop at some moment. n k k g k equals to uh, zero. And that's it. And let's look what I got. So I got equations. So my system of equations became equivalent to the following system. n11 g1 equals to 0, n22 g2 equals to 0, up to some nss gs equals to 0. And maybe there are more generators, maybe I just had not too many equations, and there are no restrictions, so gs plus 1 to the d up to g k are just arbitrary. But then one can easily see what my group looks like. So my group from here, one, one can easily deduce that my group is z power uh, k minus s times z over n11 z times to the d times z over n s s uh, z. And the homomorphism takes any linear combination and uh, takes the first coefficient module n11, second module n22, last module nss, 
and the remaining just go to this z power k minus s. And that's uh, pretty obviously this is uh, just a isomorphism. So that's not a simple theorem at all. And uh, notice, it kind of involves this relatively elementary procedure of working with this integer matrices. And it was important everything is integer. And every time we kind of applied this Euclidean algorithm divided with remainder to make coefficients smaller one after another. Um, and in some spirit, it's kind of doing linear algebra, but uh, where you don't have a field around, instead you have z. And the reason why this theorem works is because z is not so much better than a field. And namely, we kind of use the fact that every subgroup is generated by one element. And uh, this is uh, something we will generalize next quarter when we talk about modules over rings. And this will be an example of a module over rings, this abelian group over z. And uh, for some simple rings, the same story kind of works. Um, try to understand the algorithm behind that and, and uh, exactly kind of what we did looking at this uh, uh, smallest element you can obtain by smallest of positive element you can obtain by elementary operations. Okay, next two classes are about uh, quadratic residues.